Welcome to the 13th meeting in 2022 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Uh, the first item on our agenda is an evidence session with the Deputy First Minister on the Scottish Government's Continuous Improvement Programme. The Deputy First Minister is joined today by Scottish Government officials Leslie Fraser, Director General Corporate, and Ian Mitchell, Interim Director, Propriety and Ethics. I welcome you all to the meeting and invite the Deputy First Minister to make a short opening statement. Um, thank you, Convener. And uh, first of all, my apologies for detaining the committee this morning, but uh, a journey that would normally take me 90 minutes has taken me three hours this morning, so my apologies to the committee for detaining you. Uh, I'm grateful to the committee for the opportunity to give evidence uh, this morning. Following our constructive session in January, I welcome this opportunity to discuss with the committee the progress of the updated procedure for handling complaints by civil servants about current or former ministers, and the continuous improvement programme that arises from it. At the point of the last evidence session on the 25th of January, the draft procedure had been published. We were in the middle of a discussion period with staff, staff networks, ministers, trade union stakeholders, and of course, with this committee. This discussion period was constructive and respectful. It resulted in a small addition to the procedure's terms of reference, which I sent to the committee in my letter of the 24th of February, when the procedure came into operation. The feedback from the committee was also instrumental in helping us develop guidance which accompanies the procedure. I was pleased to inform the committee that the Government had appointed six external investigators and five external decision makers from a high calibre pool of applicants to carry out investigations for the updated procedure. This group has since completed an induction session led by the Propriety and Ethics Directorate. After the procedure became live, the proactive work that I identified when I last spoke to the committee as being so important to maintaining and improving a safe and respectful working environment is progressing as planned. While we hope we never have to use the updated procedure, Cabinet Secretaries and Ministers received a briefing on it after it came into operation to ensure that it is fully understood from the outset. Communications to all staff networks also accompanied its launch. Communications with staff have continued throughout March, in particular for the launch of the associated revised staff grievance policy and procedure, which came into operation on the 21st of April. In addition to this, I am um, pleased to say that the independent advisers, Mr James Hamilton and Dame Ailish Angelini, have been given final copies of the procedure and invited to consider updates to the Scottish Ministerial Code. We are now looking to the future and to the activities in the Continuous Improvement Programme for the rest of the year. The programme promotes positive standards of behaviour, seeks to prevent unacceptable behaviours and continues to work the work to create a safe and supportive environment in which staff can speak up. The programme has already involved a range of actions beyond the development of a new complaints procedure. The programme's activities are helping to embed the Scottish Government's new vision in the service of Scotland and the five core values of integrity, inclusion, collaboration, innovation and kindness at the heart of its workplace. These activities include the establishment of a, of a propriety and ethics team to provide oversight and coordination on key issues. Another activity is the review of corporate information management to improve how information and records are used, stored and processed. In the last few months, we have held discussions with those who are most closely involved with the programme and our recognised trade unions in order to begin to establish measures of success for the programme. These measures are intended not only to track the completion of the programme's activities, but also to chart how, chart how well we are doing them. The measures will ensure that we are aware of what best practice is, and that is what we adhere to at all times. They will also help us identify the areas where we can become uh, more successful. The programme, the programme looks across the organisation at the systems and business practices that are designed to continue to build a positive working environment that people can thrive in. The activities planned until the end of this year consider different aspects of culture and behaviour and the ways of working that are in place. In particular, proactive outreach work that makes contact with network groups and satellite offices has already started and will be taken forward in earnest. Throughout this period, we will continue staff communications and our engagement with our recognised trade unions. And I look forward to discussing matters with the committee today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that opening uh, statement. I um, will obviously start off with some questions and we will widen out the session to colleagues around the table. Um, the report has, has talked a lot about uh, updating the complaints procedure, not just in isolation. 
but within a wider context that fosters a culture of openness, transparency and inclusion. So, uh, can, can you advise as to what specific activities are taking place to foster that culture of openness, transparency and inclusion? There's a range of uh, measures, Convener, which are taken forward. Um, there is uh, quite clearly the, um, the, the, the routine training and development of members of staff in the processes and procedures of the uh, civil service uh, to ensure that we have in place the appropriate support to um, ministers in the taking of decisions and in ensuring that um, there is uh, a very clear uh, and a transparent process around that um, uh, process of decision making. Obviously, that um, uh, will vary across different parts of the organisation, ultimately coming to the decisions that are taken by Cabinet uh, through the Cabinet decision making process. Um, and all of these um, elements of the decision making process are kept under constant review. In relation to the um, some of the wider issues around the procedure, I've set out in my opening statement some of the steps that have been taken to ensure that um, staff are aware of uh, staff and ministers are aware of all of the details within the um, the procedures around about um, uh, any issues of complaints, so they can be properly and fully handled um, as appropriately. And lastly, it can be obviously the, the, the government focuses on its um, obligations to share widely the information that is available to government, which is undertaken through routine publication schedules, uh, of which there are uh, a very significant number, uh, and obviously responding to the, um, the more detailed and specific requests for information that come invariably through the Freedom of Information regime and other channels. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, you, you, you talked about the staff and staff training. And I understand that 85% uh, of staff respondents say they're familiar with the organisation's values uh, in the People's Survey 2022. Uh, and the next phase of the vision implementation will shift from awareness raising to behaviour change. What behaviours do you believe need to change? It's a I, I suppose the, the, the best way to answer that question, Convener, is to, is, is to do so by reference to the point I made in my opening statement about the values of the organisation and what we expect to see. So, in a sense, the, the flip side of that is that any behaviour that is incompatible with those values is the behaviour that has to change. So, we are setting it out in what I would say is a, a, a proactive and positive way about what are the values of the organisation, what we expect members of staff to see, so that is openly communicated to, to members of staff. And any individual that believes they are in a circumstance, a working environment, which is not consistent or conducive to those values, is essentially invited to and given a platform to uh, to raise their concerns through the internal processes of the Scottish Government. So I would hope that members of staff would take um, a very clear signal from the communication of those values that that, is, that should be the norm of their experience and if it is not then there are channels that enable them to raise those concerns and for those concerns to be addressed. And of course what we've I think seen um, with, with encouragement has been a positive response within the staff surveys about the reduction of behaviours that uh, all of us would judge to be unacceptable. And how have the staff received this? I think generally uh, staff response has been, has been good. I think the, 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 the survey evidence you highlight, convener, indicates that staff are aware of the efforts that are being made to ensure that we, are, we have the appropriate culture in which staff can operate, um, that that can be reflected in their uh, experience, and uh, that staff feel empowered to, raise, uh, to, well, to influence the process and to raise any concerns that they may have. Now, um, I noticed that uh, six external investigators and five external uh, decision makers uh, have been recruited to carry out investigations for the updated procedure. Uh, 
and the reduction sessions have been carried out. Um, how did you come to this figure of six and five, and what were the criteria used for deciding who you would actually um, appoint? And also, um, what is the nature of their appointment? I mean, I, I realise that they're kind of giving ongoing advice, etc. But are they on retainer? Are they, you know, just could you be a bit more specific about who they are and what what they're what they're actually going to be doing? Uh, as we move forward? The selection process um, has been undertaken through the, um, the way we would normally undertake a public appointments process. So there is a person specification, um, people are invited to apply. Um, there is then um, a sifting process and um, a selection process that is undertaken in accordance with um, uh, the approach that we take to public appointments in general. The, uh, the, the individuals will be, um, they are essentially, I suppose the best way to describe it, they, they are retained individuals. They are, um, they will be paid a daily rate to reflect the work that they actually undertake. So for, so for example, if should there be a, a case to be investigated or decided upon, there would be a selection process undertaken to identify who from the, the panel was um, suitable to undertake that investigation and of course a crucial issue within that will be in, in terms of the selection first of the investigator is of no prior involvement with any aspect of the, the case or the individuals involved and a similar test in relation to the decision maker who would be a different individual to the investigator and they would be um, they would be remunerated for the time that was required to be spent on the task that they were allocated to be undertaken. Uh, we've obviously had um, preparatory discussions with those individuals through an induction process, um, but the individuals, as I reported to the committee, are individuals who have come through a selection process to be appointed to, to these roles in the way that we undertake the public appointments process. I'm not sure if Ian wants to add anything to, 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 to that. Uh, that only only uh, the, the, the part of the, the question that asked about uh, you know why the number that, that we've landed with six and five. Uh, so so we advertised through the public appointments portal. There were not public appointments as such, and, and we got a really good level of interest. And one of the criteria is that they are highly experienced in in workplace uh, investigations. So uh, we didn't have a specific number in mind. Uh, but as Mr Swinney has explained, because of the daily rate thing and not, not salaried, we, we thought that number uh, was good enough to cover things like are they available. Also, if we have a case that uh, uh, goes to appeal, we have to have a different set of investigators and, and decision makers. So we thought six and five uh, was, a, was a reasonable number, but there was no hard and fast uh, rule around that. It's not because you anticipate myriad complaints or anything like that. In fact, there are it, none it's ongoing also, it, at present. Is that correct? It is, it's, it's to take into account the fact that you know there may be issues of conflict of interest because people will have knowledge. Um, it's to take into account the fact that we inserted into the procedure the appeals procedure. So, if, if we've got an individual to investigate, a separate decision maker, if we then go to appeal, we have got to have the same again, essentially, to ensure that we can have um, uh, no issues about prior involvement. So, um, the, 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 uh, as, as, as Ian Mitchell has said, there's no hard and fast judgment on that point about numbers, but uh, just simply to give us that, uh, that range and that uh, flexibility. And there are no cases at this time, are there? Uh, obviously, we don't comment on individual cases of this nature um, and uh, the, these are confidential matters that are undertaken to protect the interests of all involved but we we do hope not to be having to use the procedure okay um, just uh, one more question then and that's basically in terms of the governance oversight and record keeping um, and information management there's been a number of uh, um, uh, reports suggesting that there are concerns uh, in these areas, I'm just wondering how they are being addressed. Um, there, there is work that is constantly undertaken to ensure that we have the appropriate level of record keeping in place. Um, that will be 
uh, that will vary across uh, a range of interactions around individual cases. Um, there must be um, there must be the most assiduous recording of uh, decision making within uh, government at different levels, uh, whether that's at official level or um, in the, with the involvement of ministers. Um, there will be decision making that has to be recorded uh, formally through the channels of cabinet decision making and the processes that are involved there. So we undertake work to ensure that um, officials are trained and experienced in the capturing of the processes of government um, that stretches beyond decision making, that uh, charts um, the different stages in the development of a policy. Policies will evolve um, uh, over time with uh, extensive and detailed um, interaction on particular questions. And it's important that we have uh, an account of how those decisions have been arrived at and that that can be uh, readily made available um, when that is required to be the case. Okay, thank you very much. I'm now going to open out the session to colleagues around the table. And the first uh, member to ask questions will be Liz, to be followed by Daniel. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, the Deputy First Minister will be very aware of the fact that this committee requested the presence at committee of the former um, Permanent Secretary, and we were uh, very disappointed that that uh, request was uh, declined. And I know the Deputy First Minister can't comment on the specifics of that, but it has raised two issues for us as a committee. Firstly, that as yet this Parliament hasn't been able to scrutinise uh, the previous Permanent Secretary about some of the issues uh, that uh, she felt um, had caused some difficulties within uh, the administration process. But secondly, it has raised uh, a concern about the accountability of the um, Permanent Secretary, whoever he or she may be, uh, to the Scottish Government, but also to Parliament. And I raise, I raise these points, Deputy First Minister, because I think they're extremely important in the context of public scrutiny here, that we wanted specific questions answered um, about um, nothing, nothing to do with the events of the difficult uh, trials that had taken place, nothing to do with that at all, but what procedures might have been organised better had we been able to question and get that evidence from the person who was right in the front line? Firstly, can I ask, would you accept that that is a problem uh, for this committee? And secondly, could you explain to us how you think the accountability to Parliament should rest with a permanent secretary? I think the, the, the point I would make, the fundamental point, and I think this point is made in the letter that was sent by the current permanent secretary, John Paul Marx, to the convener uh, some weeks ago, uh, in March, I think the 10th of March I have in my mind, um, it is essentially to make the point that the permanent secretary is an office holder. I, 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 I don't want to to, to, to make a, a sort of an obtuse remark or anything that sounds disrespectful, but the permanent secretary isn't an individual. They are an office holder. So any of the questions that um, Liz Smith is, or the committee is interested in can be put to the permanent secretary. And I understand the permanent secretary is coming to the committee uh, very shortly. So the I, I think in, in that point of accountability to me is absolutely fundamental that the permanent secretary is the leading civil servant in the Scottish Government and therefore um, I, I, as that office holder uh, that uh, the permanent secretary must be available to, to come to committee and to answer for the issues that are relevant to the Scottish Government uh, on an all-time basis. Um, I, I, I view that as the same relationship as I have with a parliamentary committee. I am here to answer on the government's behalf. And the permanent secretary makes the point in the letter to the convener that the 
that civil servants do not act in an individual capacity, they act on behalf of ministers and their authority comes from that relationship um, in acting on behalf of ministers. So I, I hope that addresses the point that Liz Smith is interested in making. And I, th I think also in relation to the questions about the, um, the difficulties that lay at the heart of the complaints procedure in 2018, I think those issues have been really openly scrutinised in the process that was undertaken by a specific parliamentary committee prior to the 2021 election, and then also in the scrutiny this committee has given to the procedure that has arisen from those events, which is designed to address the issues that emerged during that process. Uh, and obviously, I, I, this is my second appearance at committee to address some of those questions. Uh, th thank you, and um, th that's helpful. I, I still think there are really two issues here, Mr Swinney. The, the first of them, you're quite right, is what happens in terms of the accountability and going forward and to ensure that that process is as strong as it possibly can be. Our problem as a committee, given the non-appearance of the uh, previous permanent secretary who was very much involved in some of the, um, well, in, at the time when there were obviously serious issues, because we've not been able to have some of that feedback, it's much more difficult for us to scrutinise what the best way forward should be and to ask ministers about that. And you're absolutely right that you've been very upfront about uh, what is happening. Do you accept that our um, work has been slightly compromised by the fact that it, for, in a public session of committee, it's been difficult for us to know exactly what went on in terms of the processes and how that could have been better? Well, I, 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 I don't share that view um, for, because of the fact that there was extensive scrutiny of that process undertaken by a specific parliamentary committee prior to the 2021 election, so at which the former permanent secretary made, uh, if my memory serves me right, more than one appearance at that committee. Um, so the the issues that I think pertained about that, um, uh, all that went on at that period, have been openly scrutinised by a committee of parliament. I accept it's not by this committee of parliament, but it certainly was by a committee of parliament in, I don't think any of us could say anything other than very extensive and laborious detail prior to the 2021 election. Um, so I, I think that's all on the record. And then secondly, um, the permanent secretary would be essentially making a contribution uh, essentially on behalf of Scottish ministers. That is the only basis upon which the permanent secretary um, as a civil servant can speak. You know, civil servants are not making individual appearances at committee. They represent ministers. Um, and what is crucial is that in all of these cases, um, there is effective uh, and open engagement with committees on those questions. And uh, you know, as I say, uh, uh, I'm here to set out the lessons that have been learned from that pr process and how they've influenced the, the, the new complaints process that we have in place. And uh, I know the Permanent Secretary will be happy to engage in any issues the committee has on its it, mind. It, it's just on, on exactly that point, that the, the, the role of the two committees are actually different. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that the previous committee that investigated the, the issues surrounding uh, the very extensive problems before the 2021 election, it had a very specific role. We have a different role. And that different role is about how uh, public administration is made accountable. And our concern is that in order to ensure that we are scrutinising ministers like yourself when you come to committee, it would have been helpful for us to have, um, from the horse's mouth as it were, exactly what some of the perceived challenges had been. Nothing to do with 
all the events of what went on for the other committee to question, but actually what structures could be improved. And I'm just asking if you would accept that that has been difficult for us because we've not been able to hear that evidence. I, 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 I don't take that view for, for the reason that, that I set out that I think a lot of those questions about what went wrong with the process and procedure um, was very clearly op and openly aired in the committee prior to the 2021 election. And indeed, one of the issues that the convener has just questioned me about uh, was about the necessity, and I went back to this point a couple of times in my responses, about the fact that the necessity for there to be no prior involvement of individuals in a particular case. That was one of the significant flaws in the previous handling, which I think became very clear in the process of the parliamentary committee. So whilst I understand and I, 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 the, the point that Liz Smith is making to me, that this committee has not undertaken that exercise, my contention would be another parliamentary committee has done so and we are now in the process of learning the lessons from that and changing practice as a consequence, which I'm very happy to engage with the committee about, and I'm certain the permanent secretary will be likewise. Thank you for that. I just make the point that I think the scrutiny is the, is the important thing, and I think that's what this committee's role is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Daniel, to be followed by Michelle. Thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask uh, uh, two broad areas of uh, questions. One is just around progress, the other is about uh, some of the, the, the content of the, the future work, especially around the Ministerial Code. But just on progress, uh, uh, I know that briefings have t or taken place with Ministers. I'm just wondering if you could just elaborate in, in what form that briefing has taken and whether every Minister has undertaken uh, that briefing. And, and similarly, uh, I, you know, my assumption is that this procedure is going to be most relevant to those civil servants who have the closest contact with ministers. And therefore, in terms of that wider piece of work, in terms of uh, information and training, has there been prioritisation amongst more senior civil servants, such as uh, you know, director general and director level and private offices? And, and if so, uh, you know, what, what progress has been made in terms of that sort of targeted uh, training? Um, in relation to the, um, the, the, the briefing of ministers, um, the format, uh, as with an awful lot of life in recent past, has been, it has been done online. Um, so there have been briefing sessions uh, undertaken by, um, by teams and uh, colleagues will, um, parliamentary colleagues will understand there has been a three-line whip applied to those sessions. Uh, so Mr Johnson will know what I'm talking about there. Um, the, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm simply saying it's terminology with which we, were, we are all familiar. Um, uh, with the exception that the First Minister has been briefed separately, uh, I've uh, essentially convened those briefings with the Permanent Secretary. Um, we have had uh, input from uh, specific members of staff who have been involved in the formulation of the briefing. Um, there has been an explanation of the procedure. Written copies have been provided to ministers in advance of the, the briefing session. And um, there has been the opportunity for questions to be raised by ministers about the, 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 any issues in relation to the procedure. So I can confirm that all ministers have been party to that, uh, to that briefing. Um, and as I say, the First Minister has been briefed separately. Um, in relation to the awareness amongst members of staff, uh, there has been a general awareness to all members of staff because it's important that all members of staff hear the message. I, I do understand the distinction that Mr Johnson makes about staff who will be in closest proximity to, um, to, to, to ministers. That is not always driven by seniority. That is uh, driven by close proximity. Um, I work very closely with um, uh, some staff who will um, uh, be more junior members of staff, but I couldn't function without the excellent support that they provide for me. And um, it's important that that is reflected in who is advised about the procedure. But 
Um, that, that work is underway to ensure there's been specific briefing sessions undertaken with private office because obviously there's a huge amount of interaction between ministers and private office staff. Probably I would say you know, that, well, there must be, that must actually be the area of most interaction between civil servants and ministers. Um, and then there will be a range of other interactions more generally across the specialisms within the government. And we, 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 we have to make sure that um, members of staff are, um, have access to the procedure. And I'm satisfied that that is available, but it will be the source as the continuous improvement programme indicates of ongoing dialogue to ensure that that's the case. Uh, and I note that uh, as part of the recommendations, an induction uh, 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 session uh, or, or, or uh, training is, is meant to be put in place for ministers. It, has that actually been put together? Is that in place? Um, uh, or, 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 or if not, when will that be in place? Well, after the 2021 election, <clears throat> there was a, a, a formal induction programme for ministers. Um, and that has taken place. Uh, that covered a whole range of different topics from the, um, from the administrative and process type issues such as this, or um, you know, the expectations of interaction with, uh, uh, with, uh, with private offices, and then about some of the wider uh, policy specific areas so that all ministers, for example, um, are briefed around about um, some of the policy objectives on climate change, for example, recognising that that is a policy objective that transcends individual portfolios. So there's been a mixture of policy and process induction that has been undertaken since the 2021 election. And should there be any changes to ministerial appointments, a similar programme will be put in place to um, ensure that any incoming minister who does not have previous experience will Will, will be suitably briefed. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, the bulk of what we've seen to date is regards how complaints may be raised, progressed, investigated, and so on. Uh, ultimately, it's the ministerial code which will be applied that will uh, see, uh, you know, the outcomes of any such process, and indeed be 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 judged by it. Now, I note that uh, the independent uh, advisers. Uh, will be coming back uh, within three months of the published procedure. Could, I was just wondering, on, on that point, whether the Deputy First Minister could just clarify what, what the expectation is, even just in broad terms, of when, when that's likely to come back. But more importantly, you know, given the sensitivity, and given that ultimately, as we discussed last time, that it does come down to your ministerial discretion, um, uh, especially from the First Minister, as to whether or not the code is broken, uh, or not. Um, what is the parameters of that review that's being undertaken by uh, James Hamilton and Dame Ailish Angelini? Is it, is it simply going to be about the, the formulation and content of the code, or are they going to also be examining the operation of the code itself? The, 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 on the first point about timescale, um, we indicated that three months after the publication of the uh, the policy, we would, we would invite feedback from the independent advisers. Um, that will be towards the end of May, and I would expect us to, 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 to have that feedback within that timescale. And obviously, the First Minister will then need to reflect on that feedback uh, to determine if there are to be any changes to the code that will be made as a consequence of that, uh, given the responsibility the First Minister carries for the formulation of the code. Um, in relation to the, um, the scope, the advisors will be looking at um, the, essentially the interaction of the complaints handling process and any interaction with the ministerial code and whether that flows through with, um, a, 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 in, in a smooth fashion. And their recommendations, I would anticipate, uh, would be um, would, would be in that space. However, I wouldn't want to constrain the reflections of the independent advisers. And uh, I, I know the first minister will be um, happy to hear any reflections that the independent advisers have on that question, or perhaps questions that stretch beyond that um, 
uh, th th that particular relationship. Um, but you know, that, that would be me prejudging what we will hear from the independent advisors, and we'll, 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 we'll know that over the course of the next month or so. The final point I would want to say is really about the, the, the nature of the ministerial code. And, I, and I, what I'm going to say just now, I, I don't say um, it, you know, in any pejorative sense, but the current atmosphere around about ministerial codes, uh, particularly in relation to the um, position of the United Kingdom government, does raise a serious issue about the significance of the ministerial code and its implementation and application. And, you know, as a, as a minister who is bound by the code, but who is not a decision maker in relation to the code, um, I view that the adherence to that code as my fundamental duty as a minister. And it guides and shapes well, I'd like to think I don't need a ministerial code to tell me how to guide and shape but it's there as a backstop to make sure I know what is expected of me and it has to be taken with that degree of seriousness and it has to be applied with that degree of seriousness because without it it's meaningless so Mr Johnson's question gives me the opportunity to put that on the record as a reflection of what I think is the view of ministers, that the ministerial code is there to be complied with. And the last thing a minister wants is to have any speculation about whether his or her conduct or actions has in any way brought the code into question. I mean, I, I would quite agree with, with all of that, but there will always be a tension when the questions are centred on the, 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 the person who is also responsible for deciding whether or not ultimately the code has been broken or, or whether to apply it. And I think that, and, I, I, and from our previous discussion, I recognise the reasons for that, the democratic reasons, I mean, I, I do, but it is a tension nonetheless. Um, and I was just wondering whether or not that might be an area for some reflection by the independent uh, uh, advisers and whether or not there'd been any dialogue in that regard. I think the, the, there is a tension there. Mr Johnson is absolutely correct. But there is a fundamental democratic question that the, the First Minister appoints a minister and the First Minister is essentially uh, judging conduct in relation to a tabulated um, expectation of how a minister should conduct themselves. And um, the First Minister takes that code seriously in that respect and has those expectations of ministers and that is made clear by the First Minister to ministers. Um, in relation to the perspective of independent advisers, um, that would, I, I'd be entering into speculation because I just, I, I just don't know what will come back from independent advisers. But what, what I would say is when you have advisers um, of, the, um, of, of, of the track record, um, and uh, credentials of uh, Dame Ailish Angelini and Mr Hamilton, then <clears throat> being open to hearing their perspectives is something that I think would be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, to be followed by Douglas. Good morning. Uh, it took me quite a long time to get into Edinburgh today, so I have every sympathy with you. Um, I wanted to ask sort of three broad areas, if I could. First of all, around, I mean, you've indicated that you're developing measures of success for the programme, but I wanted to understand a little more flavour of how those measures of success would feed into the latest iterations of people's survey results. And also, off the back of that, what would then be put in the public domain, in other words, not how you will know the measures or test the measures of success, but how we will be able to test the measures of success in our uh, sort of responsibility for public administration. I, I think the, the, the People's Survey is published, isn't it? We publish um, certain uh, um, aspects of the People's Survey. Yes, and we do that in tandem with our colleagues in the UK government. Um, we're part of a wider uh, UK uh, People's Survey process. Uh, so we do that in tandem each year. So, in a sense, the, the, the information that 
the People Survey gives us about attitudes of members of staff is, is published to give, I suppose, the opportunity for um, committee to scrutinise what is the degree of progress that's been made in the, the general relationship of members of staff to the organisation and their experiences, and hence the importance of us um, looking at, uh, from a variety of different perspectives, you know, people survey, as Michelle Thompson will know from her, her own professional background, um, a significant indicator of um, the health of an organisation and what that and, and, and what are the challenges to the leadership of the organisation to ensure that its improvement journey is appropriate. So um, measures of that type are, are, are important in a general sense to assess the performance of the organisation. I think what we are... You'd be very careful about what we take forward here in terms of charting progress on the continuous improvement journey is that I certainly I don't want that to be judged by, you know, whether we've got a declining number of cases of complaints. That's a rather negative way of looking at it. I want us to think very carefully about how we can demonstrably um, a, a quantify how we are making progress within the, um, the organisation how we are improving staff's experiences, how we're exp uh, improving the, the capability of staff. So um, all of those different factors um, have to be reflected in the approach that we design as a consequence. I, I, and I completely agree with that. But going back to your point then, uh, Leslie, if, only, if it's done through the, <clears throat> the remit of a UK civil service kind of a, approach, how then will, will that be reflected in what is a different and more nuanced approach here. And I'd also like to understand a bit more about to what extent is it quantitative data that's published and to what extent is it uh, qualitative, because the biggest change in this will be about culture and behaviours. It's always the hardest thing to change, and it's the qualitative insights that give that flavour. So uh, perhaps the question then is how have you, how will you reflect the new kind of or updated? Because I'm thinking about the next version of people surveys, uh, how we can measure success. Will you then plan to add on additional Scottish Parliament elements? Have you thought about that to get the sense? I think there's, uh, I think there's two different dimensions here. One is about the. Um, the People's Survey, which is a, you know, is part of a, as, as Leslie says, part of a, a, a UK civil service-wide um, uh, proposition, which can give us some insight into these issues, but it's not exclusive. Which brings me on to my second point, which I, th I think is the heart of the points that Michelle Thompson puts to me, about how we design uh, an approach which enables us to be confident that the continuous improvement journey is actually having a positive effect within the organisation. And that will require us to develop um, our thinking about what will inevitably, I think, have to be much more qualitative than quantitative, which will, you know, which you know, we, we may have to think about how we you know, how we formulate conversation with staff to try to inform that qualitative process, um, uh, if, 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 if that is the type of information we're trying to extract from this experience. You know, there will be quantitative indicators that, um, that, 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 that we can identify, um, but I don't want it just to be a quantitative survey. It must begin to delve into what is the experience of members of staff in the working environment, how satisfactory is it, what can we do to, to strengthen and to improve that. And, um, uh, I'll very happily update the committee over time in our uh, periodic updates about how that um, that work is being undertaken to develop the framework and any thinking from the committee uh, or expectations from the committee in that respect would be very welcome. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to my, my uh, second uh, question. Uh, I mean, I've seen a, a lot of this kind of development in my kind of previous career, and sometimes the risk is that the process becomes the absolute, and that 
does become a real risk. So in that respect, I was uh, just a bit surprised to note that the, the review of like bringing in propriety and ethics is the last step in the process because the risk then is that the ethical approach is applied in a deontological perspective rather than a consequentialist perspective. So I wanted to understand what your thinking was about that being the last step uh, in the chain and therefore how you can like backwards look at it from a consequentialist ethical, in other words, outcome basis, because all of this is about outcome and not just about process. Yeah, I think uh, what, what I'd say at the outset is that I, I think I, I would want to, I'd, I'd want to explain uh, the the final element, not, well, I'm using the t terminology that rather makes that point, I don't want it to be viewed as a final element because propriety and ethics has been established as a distinctive directorate within the Scottish Government in response to a lot of the experiences that we have had to essentially underpin all of the work that we are un undertaking. So I, I wouldn't want the committee to think that we're only getting around to thinking about propriety and ethics at the very end. We've actually been thinking about it from the very beginning. It is absolutely running through the whole process. And the word I would want to, um, the, the words I would want to highlight in, in, in the last element of this schematic we've provided um, is a review, is the words review of the processes as opposed to reviewing the propriety and ethics, because the propriety and ethics are absolutely embedded in the process that we're undertaking. OK, thank you. And my last question then is, obviously, the new process applies to former ministers. So what consideration have you given for how iterations of the process will be communicated to them and over what timescale? And I'm, I'm both thinking at the moment, looking back, but also looking forward, you know, five years down the line, the ministers that are in post at the moment, how they will be communicated with, and not necessarily, I don't mean the detail of the process, but for them to understand that they have a responsibility to be across the process at a given point in time and as it evolves. So it's just to get a sense of where your thinking is in that. Obviously, we, you, we will have to consider um, what um, communication will be undertaken uh, based on any updates to the procedure. Of course, you know, my, my view would be that that um, has to be an open, any changes to the process has to be an open and communicated process. Um, you know, in, in, in fact, if there was to be any change to the process in the years to come, ministers would be under an obligation to advise the finance, this committee, of exactly that, which puts it into the public domain immediately. So we, you know, we would obviously have to reflect on that uh, very specific practical issue, but I think it would be a matter of public record that there had been a change or development should that take place to the procedure, and that would obviously be communicated to this committee and more widely as a consequence. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Douglas? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Deputy First Minister. I had a, a question around agency workers. I, I think I asked last time about it. Um, and, you know, I still have a concern around about agency workers. And I, I get, you know, they're not employees, they've got their own employer, so things would have to be, be different. But the new procedure says Propriet proprietary and ethics will take steps to assure that any agency worker with a concern about a minister's behaviour can have that issue addressed. So is there a separate procedure that that will follow? And will the, you know, the decision makers and, and investigators, will they get involved at all in that process? The, I, the first thing is that I, 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 I accept the point that Mr Lumsden is making to me, that there is, a, there is a specific issue about agency workers. And we did take that away after it was raised at a previous evidence session with me. And the... the the judgment is difficult because that individual is not an employee of the Scottish Government. But essentially, that individual must be able to raise any concerns they have through their own employment channels. So essentially, um, assuming that the 
organisation for which that individual works has appropriate HR processes in place to enable that to be the case. The Scottish Government must have in place appropriate contractual relationships with a contractor to make sure that should any issues be drawn to the contractor's attention as an employer, those are addressed by the Scottish Government in it would have to be in a contract management purposes, uh, or contract management relationship. But if that involved any issues about ministerial interaction, we would have to address that through our own processes as, um, uh, 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 as an organisation. So it wouldn't necessarily be through this process, which is available to our members of staff, but we would have an obligation to address those issues because of our obligations under contract. Um, because you, know, you, 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 know, you, you, you cannot have um, contractual relationships that are not working in, a, you know, in an appropriate fashion. So we would have a, a contractual obligation to address that issue. Would you see the um, decision makers and investigators taking part of that process, or would you think it would be? Because I think my concern is that you know there could be two individuals, one's agency, one's staff, both with an identical complaint, and one would be handled completely different from the other. And, you know, we've explained the, some of the reasons behind that. And I guess it would be, there could be a criticism for, for ministers that one wasn't being dealt with effectively because they were an agency worker. I, th I think what I'm trying to reassure Mr Lumsden about is that it will be a different channel, but it will have to be addressed because we cannot, you know, we cannot have a situation where uh, an agency worker is not able to raise their concerns in exactly the fashion that Mr Lumsden puts to me of you know, two individuals sitting side by side, one of whom has got certain rights because they're an SG employee and another individual who has, uh, you know, well, I would say a different uh, channel for raising the concerns about their rights through an agency employment structure. Um, but I, 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 can't, I don't envisage the investigators and decision makers being involved in this, uh, in, in the handling of an, an agency um, uh, issue. Uh, we would have to handle that through our proper management of contractual arrangements. And I guess, would a, a minister still be aware that there was a, a potential complaint being made from an agency worker? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They would. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. John. Yeah, thanks, Convener. <coughs> Just to follow up, uh, when you were, Liz Smith was asking you questions about the Permanent Secretary. And just to clarify, I mean, I think you made the point, which was my understanding as well, that civil servants are, uh, do speak for ministers. Uh, however, on top of that, um, we had advice that under Section 14 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act, um, that there is, the Permanent Secretary is also answerable to Parliament and specifically, you know, around the areas that uh, resources are used economically, efficiently and effectively. Yes, because the Permanent Secretary is also the Principal Accountable Officer, and yes. the Principal Accountable Officer uh, brings with that aspect of the role particular obligations in terms of uh, other parts of, um, of legislation for which the, the Permanent Secretary um, uh, fulfils those functions. OK, thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you. That appears to have concluded questions from the committee. So I'd like to thank the Deputy First Minister for coming here to give evidence this morning. And as the second session has been cancelled due to uh, a COVID outbreak among Skills Development Scotland, uh, that concludes our meeting this morning. Thank you all for your contributions.